Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. When I landed a job at this company six years ago, I was over the moon. They hosted all sorts of events, some for members only, others open to the public. At first, I was just part of the team, but as time went on, I climbed the ladder until I was in charge of promoting these events. Now, I took my job seriously, so seriously that I installed my own software on my work computer. We're talking Adobe Photoshop, Acrobat, and InDesign, the whole shebang. This was before the Creative Cloud subscription era, so it cost me a pretty penny. But I didn't mind. It made my job easier, and I could create stunning artwork and flyers right there at work instead of burning the midnight oil at home. Life was going well until my husband had a motorcycle accident. I was about to miss a ton of work, but my bosses surprised me. They set me up with remote access so I could work from the hospital. There I was, creating event promos while sitting next to my husband's bed. Talk about dedication, right? Fast forward a couple of years and the company got sold. Nothing really changed for me, though. I kept doing my thing turning out great work. Then came that fateful day. The general manager and HR walked into my office, looking all serious. The GM told me that due to a slowdown in business, I was being laid off effective immediately. I was shocked, but I tried to keep my cool. I told them I understood and asked if I could grab my stuff before leaving. All I wanted were these silly stuffed animals sitting on my monitor. They were gifts from members and my husband. Sentimental stuff, you know? To my surprise, the GM refused, saying they'd get my belongings to me later. They wouldn't even let me take my own stuff. I was fuming, but I left without a fuss. Here's where it gets interesting. They forgot to remove my remote access to my desktop, so I logged in and uninstalled all the Adobe software I had paid for. I didn't touch anything else. All their files were still there. Then I waited. Two weeks later, I got a call from the assistant GM. She was taking over my duties and needed to finish some artwork I've been working on. She explained she was having trouble opening the files for the project I was working on. I asked about my stuff and when I could get it back. She vaguely replied that I'd get it soon. So I told her she'd need to buy Photoshop, Acrobat, and InDesign, or she could go online and find some open source software and learn how to use it. I could almost hear her jaw drop through the phone. I got my stuffed animals a few days later but I have no idea how they finished that artwork. The cherry on top? I ran into the GM while grocery shopping about a month after being laid off. By then, I'd found a new job. A better one, actually. We exchanged pleasantries with him asking how I'd been and me replying that I was doing great. When he mentioned being busy as always, I surprised him by saying I wanted to thank him. He seemed confused and asked what for. I explained that letting me go had led me to a much better opportunity. I gave him a big hug. He seemed confused, maybe even a little regretful. They thought they could just discard me, like I meant nothing, but they quickly realized how much they relied on my skills and my software. Life has a funny way of working out sometimes. My wife and I were excited to start our new life together, especially with a baby on the way. The house was perfect, spacious, modern and with a beautiful backyard where we imagined our future child playing. Everything was going great until about a month after we moved in. That's when I noticed something odd happening in our backyard. The grass seemed to be sinking in some spots, and a few of our plants were wilting despite regular watering. At first, I thought it might be some kind of pest problem or maybe an issue with the soil. But then I saw our neighbor, let's call her Karen, acting suspiciously. One evening, I was taking out the trash when I saw Karen sneaking out of her basement with a shovel and a headlamp. Curious, I decided to keep an eye on her over the next few days. That's when I realized she was digging a tunnel under her house. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just some weird hobby. But then I started noticing more issues in our yard, and I knew something had to be done. I decided to confront Karen about it. I approached Karen and asked if we could talk for a minute. She greeted me cheerfully and asked what she could do for me. I told her that I had noticed her digging under her house and expressed my concern about 
how it seemed to be affecting my property. Karen dismissed my worries, saying it was all part of a plan. Confused, I asked her what plan she was talking about. She then explained that it was an escape plan for when aliens come in 2027. I asked her to clarify if she was really talking about aliens. Karen confirmed, explaining that aliens were coming to abduct everyone in 2027, and she was building an escape route for the good of humanity. I tried to reason with her, saying that regardless of her beliefs about aliens, her digging was causing problems in my yard and needed to stop. Karen refused to stop, insisting that it was too important and that we needed to be prepared. I explained that I understood she believed in this, but she couldn't dig under my property as it was trespassing and damaging my yard. Karen argued that it wasn't trespassing if it was underground and claimed she was doing me a favor, saying I'd thank her when the aliens came. I realized there was no reasoning with her. I went back home and discussed the situation with my wife. We agreed that we needed to take action to protect our property. The next day, I called the police to report the trespassing and property damage. When they arrived, Karen was in full alien conspiracy mode. The police officer addressed Karen, informing her that I had reported her for digging under my property. Karen insisted that it wasn't my property because it was underground and claimed she was saving everyone from an alien invasion. The officer explained that regardless of her beliefs, she couldn't dig under someone else's property without permission and needed to stop immediately. Karen warned that we'd all regret this when the aliens came. The police gave her a warning and told her to fill in the tunnel. A few days later, I caught her trying to dig again, this time at night. I decided to take more drastic measures. I installed security cameras around our property, including some pointed at the areas where she had been digging. I also hired a geologist to assess the damage and provide an official report. With the evidence from the cameras and the geologist's report, I was able to get a restraining order against Karen, preventing her from coming onto or under our property. I also filed a civil lawsuit for the damages to our yard. The court case was interesting, to say the least. Karen showed up with tinfoil on her head, claiming it would protect her from alien mind control. Her lawyer looked like he wanted to disappear into the floor. The judge asked Karen if she understood that she had caused significant damage to my property. Karen replied that she was trying to save humanity from the incoming aliens. The judge explained that regardless of her beliefs, she did not have the right to damage someone else's property and ruled in my favor. Karen was ordered to pay for all the damages to our property and to fill in the tunnels she had dug. She was also required to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. We used the money from the lawsuit to repair our yard and install a state-of-the-art security system. We also built a beautiful playground for our child, who was born a few months after the court case ended. Karen eventually moved away, presumably to find a place where she could dig her alien escape tunnels in peace. Last I heard, she had joined some kind of doomsday prepper community in the mountains. And if the aliens do show up in 2027, well, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I was always the tech-savvy one in the family, constantly tinkering with gadgets and saving up for the latest gaming consoles. My pride and joy back then was my original Xbox, complete with a DVD remote and receiver kit. It was my escape from the world, my personal entertainment center. My sister, on the other hand, was more of a social butterfly. She had a boyfriend who'd come over pretty often, and they'd always want to watch movies together. Now you'd think that wouldn't be a problem, right? Well, it became one because my sister didn't have a DVD player in her room. Guess who did? Yep, me. At first, I didn't think much of it. I'd be out with friends or doing homework in the living room, and when I'd come back to my room, I'd notice my Xbox was missing. The first couple of times, I shrugged it off. But then, it kept happening, and it started to bug me. One day, I confronted my sister about it. I asked her if she had been taking my Xbox to watch movies. She casually admitted to it, acting like it wasn't a big deal since I wasn't using it at the time. I told her it was my stuff and that she could at least ask first. She brushed off my concerns, telling me not to be selfish and that it was just for a couple of hours. She didn't even see what was wrong with taking my things without asking. 
I tried talking to our parents about it, but they just told me to share and be nice to my sister. It was frustrating, to say the least. This went on for a while. I'd come home, find my Xbox gone, and have to wait until they were done with their movie day to get it back. Sometimes they'd even leave it in her room overnight, and I'd have to go fetch it in the morning. One day, I overheard them talking in the kitchen. My sister was suggesting they watch a new horror movie that night, mentioning that I'd be out with my friends so they could use my Xbox again. Her boyfriend agreed, saying he'd been wanting to see that movie. That was the last straw. They were literally planning to take my stuff without permission. Again, I knew I had to do something, but I didn't want to cause a huge fight. That's when I remembered the parental controls on the Xbox. I spent the next hour figuring out how to set up the controls. I restricted it to only play G-rated content and locked it with a password. It was petty, I know, but I was fed up. The next day I made sure to be out of the house when I knew her boyfriend was coming over. When I got back, I found my sister waiting for me, looking annoyed. She asked if I had done something to the Xbox because they couldn't watch their movie. I casually confirmed that I had set up parental controls, claiming it was for safety reasons. She demanded to know why I would do that and told me to turn it off. I refused, saying I keep it like that since they liked using it so much, and I wanted to ensure they were watching appropriate content. She threatened that our parents would make me change it back. I challenged her to go ahead and tell them, suggesting she explain why she needed to use my Xbox without asking while she was at it. She stormed off, but surprisingly, she didn't tell our parents. I guess she realized she'd have to admit to taking my stuff without permission. From that day on, my Xbox stayed in my room. No more unauthorized movie nights, no more finding my console missing. If they wanted to watch a movie, they had to ask, and I'd only allow G-rated films. It took a while, but eventually my sister started saving up for her own DVD player. She never apologized for taking my stuff, but at least she stopped doing it. And her boyfriend avoided eye contact with me for weeks after that. My idea of adventure was finding a new coffee shop or trying out the latest food truck. But last year, I decided it was time for a change. I wanted to challenge myself to step out of my comfort zone and try something completely different. That's how I ended up planning a solo camping trip in the wilderness. Now I'm not what you'd call an outdoorsy person. The closest I'd ever come to camping was falling asleep on a park bench after a long night out. But I was determined to prove to myself, and maybe to my skeptical friends, that I could handle it. I spent weeks researching, watching YouTube videos, and buying gear I thought I'd need. Fast forward to last Christmas. My grandma, bless her heart, gave me this multi-tool thing. It looked like a tiny Swiss army knife on steroids. I remember thinking, great, another useless gadget to clutter my drawer. I thanked her, of course, but I was already planning to re-gift it to some unsuspecting cousin next Christmas. Little did I know that this useless gift would end up saving my butt on my big camping adventure. So there I was, last week, in the middle of nowhere, feeling pretty smug about my roughing it skills. I'd managed to drive to the campsite without getting lost, thank you GPS, and I was ready to set up my tent. That's when I realized I'd forgotten my mallet to hammer in the tent stakes. Panic started to set in. I was miles from civilization, surrounded by trees and probably bears. At least that's what my city-bred imagination told me. Then, like a light bulb moment in a cartoon, I remembered the multi-tool. I dug through my backpack, praying I hadn't left it at home. When my hand touched it at the bottom of the bag, I almost cried with relief. I pulled it out, and sure enough, there was a tiny hammer attachment. It wasn't ideal, but it was something. When I started hammering the stakes, I muttered to myself, wondering if this tiny tool would actually work. To my surprise, it did the job. It took longer than a regular mallet would have, but beggars can be choosers, right? But that was just the beginning. Throughout the trip, that multi-tool became my new best friend. I used the saw to cut branches for my campfire, the can opener for my beans, because apparently I thought I was going to find a can opener growing on a tree, and even the magnifying glass to remove a splinter I got while trying to look rugged by carrying a big log. I was so excited when I actually managed to catch a fish, 
and I wanted to measure it to brag to my friends back home. Lo and behold, the multi-tool had a tiny ruler. I held up the fish feeling proud and jokingly asked myself who the city slicker was now. Then, out of nowhere, I heard some commotion from a nearby camp. Curious, I wandered over to see what was going on. There was this woman, to call her Karen, yelling at a park ranger. She was waving around a list of demands like it was the Constitution. Karen was complaining loudly about the lack of facilities, demanding to know where the Wi-Fi and room service were. She insisted that she had paid good money for this experience. The park ranger tried to explain that this was a campsite, not a hotel, and that they didn't provide those amenities here. He emphasized that it was meant to be a nature experience. Karen, however, wasn't having it. She angrily declared that she hadn't signed up for this and demanded to speak to the ranger's manager. I stepped in, asking if everything was okay. Karen turned to me, venting her frustrations. She complained about the conditions and how she couldn't believe that they were expected to sleep on the ground and cook their own food. I tried not to laugh as I explained that this was kind of the point of camping. Karen looked at me in shock, insisting that she had booked a five-star forest retreat, not a camping trip. I pulled out my trusty multi-tool and showed it to her, explaining how sometimes the best experiences come from unexpected places. I shared how this little tool had saved my whole trip and suggested that if she gave it a chance, she might find something to enjoy here too. Karen scoffed at my suggestion, declaring that she was going to call her lawyer. The ranger thanked me for trying to help, saying that some people just don't understand the concept of camping. Not only had I survived my first camping trip, but I'd also gained a whole new appreciation for my grandma's gift. I made a mental note to give her an extra big hug next time I saw her. And maybe I'd start planning my next outdoor adventure. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.